A while ago I made a video about this chip, Intel's last single core CPU, and it was, well, a video to remember. But that did beg the question, what about AMD's last single core CPU? Well, I've got it right here, and it's even worse and weirder than you'd imagine. Today we're going to delve into this chip, see how it performs, play games on it, overclock it, and at the end it won't be a single core anymore. So let's get started. With the launch of the Athlon 64X2 in 2005, AMD was far ahead of dual-core development with their Direct Connect architecture and Hypertransport bus, which was more advanced than Intel's frontside bus system. However, despite their technical dual-core superiority, AMD let the single-core live on for a long time outside of the limelight within the depths of their bottom-of-the-barrel Sempron line of CPUs. In 2009, four years after the introduction of their first dual-core, AMD presented the Sempron 140. It was based on the K10 architecture then found in their quad-core Phenom chips, and it was a 2.7 GHz single-core chip. Okay, fine, but curiously, that wasn't the end of that, as nearly a year later, in late 2010, they added the 2.8 and 2.9 GHz Sempron 145 and 150. For those who really thought that those extra few megahertz would elevate the single core experience. But then we get to the real head scratcher as yet a year later in mid 2011, AMD gifted the world this, the Sempron 130. Somehow in AMD's eternal wisdom they decided that what the world really needed was another Sempron but now both clocked slower and with only half the cache, 512 kilobytes in mid 2011. They'd already been selling the other models for two years. What made them go, well I know what consumers will really appreciate, even less cash. Like what? All our specifications of this measly chip include no turbo, no onboard GPU, a whopping 45 watt TDP for one core. But we do at least get dual channel DDR3. So let's see what that means in terms of performance. We're now here in the labs with the Sempron 130. And for a test bed, we've got an AM3 ASRock 870 Extreme 3 motherboard. We've got a rather overkill Cytomugen cooler. We've got 16GB DDR3-1600. For a GPU, we've got something a bit more modern. Here we've got an RX 5700 8GB, so that should be plenty. And I've already pre-installed Windows 10 Professional on a SATA 3 SSD, as I certainly wasn't going to be doing all the installation on a single core chip. So let's get it all up and running. We're now here in Windows 10 Pro 64-bit and it's really not very nice. Boot time was not terrible in around a minute or so, but within Windows itself it's really struggling with only one core and one thread. If you're doing just some basic browsing on some simple website, it's actually not too bad. But anything more advanced than that in terms of websites, for example, if we say we load up YouTube, it's really going to struggle with just loading in uh, items on the site itself. And the same is true if, for example, were to open up Steam. And finally, there we are. I don't know how long that was, but I'll put it up on the screen. But yeah, once it is loaded in, you, it is somewhat responsive, but it just takes a really long time. YouTube playback is an interesting one, as for that we can use the acceleration of the GPU to help the Sempron, and it's actually better than expected. Despite 100% CPU utilization, it was able to smoothly play 1080p 60 VP9 playback. It did have some dropped frames, but it was smooth overall. And it even made an effort to play 4K 60 VP9 playback, but that was just too much for it. Still, it was better than expected. And now we get to gaming, and here we're going to do a little challenge. I'm about to launch GTA 5, and I want you to comment below how long do you think it's going to take the Sempron to load up GTA 5 from the moment I click play until it is actually loaded into the game world. 
So here we go. There we go. It's finally something happening. Could be. I'll be it does look like we've got something. I don't know how long that was, but it took so long I've actually had to play another game. And did you guess correctly? And the performance in GTA 5 is well the worst I've ever tested on a CPU. After 20 minutes of loading times were greeted with around 5 to 6 FPS, but Regularly, the entire system will ground to a halt for many seconds. Compare that to Intel's last single-core CPU, thanks to a more modern architecture and hyper-threading, we're able to around 12 to 14 FPS. And in this case, we're getting less than half. It is really unplayable. But it turned out to be one of the better performances, as Doom 2016 failed to even load in at all. Beam and G Drive run about as well as GTA 5, running around 6 to 8 FPS. And City Skylines ran between 1 to 2 FPS. Interesting, as we'll get into later, overclocking had a profound effect on gaming performance. As for synthetic tests, in Cinebench R15 it got 56 points. Less in single thread compared to the 1.9 GHz Sandy Bridge single core. And less compared to the 5 year older Core 2 Quad at the same clock speed. In 7-zip things were even worse, where it was beaten in compression by the 1.7 GHz Pentium M from 2005. And Intel's last single core was basically twice as fast here. But what Intel's chip didn't offer was the ability to overclock, so here we're going to increase both the bus speed and the hypertransport link. And after a lot of tweaking, we're now running this beast a whole GHz faster at 3.6 GHz with 1.5 vCore. And this has had a pretty dramatic effect on performance. In Cinebench R15, performance improved a whopping 43% from 56 to now 80 points. Meaning it was now closing in on the Celeron G465 with hyper-threading enabled, albeit at nearly twice the frequency. And here in GTA 5, the performance improvement is even greater. Previously we saw between 5 to 7 FPS, but now at 3.6 GHz, running at basically three times that, between 13 to 20 FPS, most of the time around 15. So it's running basically as well as Intel's last single core CPU, but at twice the frequency. But still, for that extra gigahertz, the performance improvement is huge. Beam and G Drive saw a similar improvement going from 8 to now 18 FPS. So it definitely seems this extra gigahertz has reached a threshold where the entire system just runs a lot better. And now we get to the pièce de la résistance of the Sempron 130, and that is making it not a single core anymore. A common practice in chip manufacturing is starting off with a bigger die, and then putting that bigger die in multiple models over your range. Say you start off with a 6 core CPU, there's a good chance that not all of those 6 cores will always be perfect. Some may be straight up defective, others may not reach the desired voltage and frequency requirements. So what manufacturers will do is disable those unwanted cores, and then, for example, setting it as a quad-core chip instead. But those disabled cores, in most cases, are fused off in hardware, so you can't ever access them again. But for this generation of AMD K10 chips, you could actually unlock them with the right motherboard. In this case, this ASRock 870. And for the Sempron 130, we can actually gain access to one secret core, in theory. The particular function we're looking for is the ASRock UCC, or Unlock CPU Core. And with this function enabled, suddenly our Sempron becomes an Athlon 2 X2-4300E, which is a CPU which never existed. So then the question becomes, well, does it work? Well, as I just said, there are multiple reasons on why this core could have been disabled. It could have been broken, it just couldn't have been very good. It could also be that it was perfectly fine, but AMD simply needed a single core chip. In this case, it's a bit weird. We can get it to work in the BIOS, but as soon as you load up an OS, first Windows, it would simply crash. Then I thought, what about if I just underclock it severely? I brought it down to only a few hundred megahertz, 
increased v-core, only a single stick of memory, lower the hypertransport bus, etc. to get it just as slow as possible. And in Windows it got a bit further. So then I thought perhaps Windows is just too heavy for it. I then got tiny Linux on a USB drive, which really takes absolutely no resources at all. And it got a bit further, but as soon as it would start to load up the kernel, it would simply crash and I cannot get it to go any further. So I think something deep within that extra core is very wrong, which prevents it from, uh, from working. So unfortunately, it still will remain a Sempron. So there we have it, AMD's final single core CPU. And as I said, it's even worse and weirder than I had imagined when I first had the idea for this video. Performance out of the box is truly terrible, even for 2011 standards. I mean, it got beaten by a Pentium M. Sure, it was extremely cheap, but for just a bit more money, the experience just would have been so much better having a dual core. It does redeem itself once overclocked, and if you get a nice example, which you can successfully unlock, it's actually a pretty nice deal. But that would have required a more expensive motherboard, which if you were building a PC with a $30 CPU, that probably wasn't on the table. Compared to Intel's last single core CPU, those were a bit more expensive, but performance out of the box was better, so was efficiency, and they did have an integrated GPU, but personally, I wouldn't have recommended either of them. Nevertheless, it's been a lot of fun playing around with this chip, and I hope you have enjoyed it as well. If you did, a like would be very much appreciated, and why not subscribe to the Fully Buffered channel? In any case, that was all for now and bye bye.